Hi everyone. So, it's finally happened. I've reached the first major milestone of any YouTube channel and gained 1,000 subscribers and joined the YouTube Partnership Program. I obviously couldn't have done this without your support, so thank you for sticking by and continuing to enjoy my videos. Even in the past two weeks since passing this milestone, the channel growth has been significant, and my Halo video from October 2021 in particular has gained a lot of traction. First of all, I wanted to address something that's coming up a lot in the comments about me determining that the Halo would have saved Jules Bianchi's life. That came from me basically misinterpreting what actually happened in the accident, as I thought he had suffered essentially the same accident as Maria de Velotta and hit the crane helmet first. Of course, when you consider the damage inflicted to Felipe Massa's helmet from a small spring, and the severity of Maria de Velotta's injuries when she was travelling at less than half the speed, he no doubt would have been killed instantly by that. So the Halo still would have absolutely saved Maria de Velotta's life, but it's unlikely to have made much difference of Bianchi. With that out of the way, let's crack on with the video. I asked you to submit some questions for me to answer, and 12 of you have, which is honestly way more than I was expecting, so thank you. So let's get started with those. So, Marco Matkovic asks, Why did you start to make these types of long F1 videos? So, gentlemen, a short view into the past. In both 2011 and 2012, I went to the British Grand Prix, and one of the many things I loved about it was that you got equal coverage of every driver, as obviously they all have to pass you once a lap. I always love an underdog, and like many people, I was interested in the battle at the back between Lotus Version and HRT, and it was illuminating to see their race battles unfold, as normally they would only appear on the world feed when crashing or being lapped. I don't remember much about the 2011 race, other than it being Daniel Ricciardo's debut, but I remember in 2012 that they stuck with the rest of the grid for the first three laps or so, and as the race went on, Heike Kovalainen stormed away from the Marussias and HRTs, who stayed close for most of the race, until the blue flags started getting in the way, at which point it became very difficult to track who was where. Fast forward to 2020, the UK goes into lockdown, and with a lot more free time on my hands, and my career prospects seemingly on hold, I decided to start a YouTube channel about Formula 1. Most F1 YouTubers do videos which are less than 10 minutes in length, but there are others that have done much longer videos, so that I knew that if I did, I'd get away with it, so to speak. What I wanted to do was take a real deep dive into the backmarker teams which often got ignored or overlooked. It's all too easy to sum up a season with Virgin or HRT in a single sentence, and naturally people had done videos on them which covered their whole story in about 5 minutes. I wanted to get a really good idea of how their races unfolded, so I made this decision to do essentially race reports that would cover strategies, mechanical problems, general race pace, etc. in a way that nobody else had really done, and just tell the story of each race from their perspective. With the ranking videos, which often end up being my favourite ones to do, as tedious as they can be, I got the idea after seeing someone rank every single episode of The Simpsons, which took over 4 hours. Ranking every single F1 driver is not feasible for a myriad of reasons, but I deduced that I could get away with ranking every driver or car in a decade in an hour or so. Again, it's not something anyone else has done, as everyone else just does top 10s, which is understandable, as as much as I love making those videos, they take forever. An average bloke asks, what's your writing process for the scripts? Also, how do you come up with ideas for different vids? Do you try to take inspiration from other F1 centred channels? It depends on what type of video I'm making. For the team history ones, I basically have to watch every race in a season back, whilst also scouring over the lap charts, pit strategies and everything else I need to get all the data, as well as looking at post-race interviews of drivers, and reports on any technical updates to the cars, and of course anything I can find on Team Origins. These types of videos take by far the longest to make because I often have to re-watch the same bits of races over and over again, focusing on something that happened at the back of the grid, which is usually out of shot and not picked up by the commentators, and waiting for the timing data to update itself only for it to go to the drivers at the back and then cut to a replay. With Haas, it's fairly straightforward because the modern on-screen graphics are very useful and there are also onboard videos available. But the older the team, the harder it gets, as you get both less and less coverage and less and less data in each race broadcast. With the ranking videos, I make a data table first. This, for example, is the one for the 2000s drivers. After that's completed, I then start on the script and try and assess each driver in a couple of paragraphs, though the further up the rankings you go, the more there is to write about. Determining the rankings comes primarily from the data table, but I also take into account the teams the drivers drove for, how they fared against their teammates, if they crashed a lot, etc. And with the cars, it's looking at pace versus reliability and any technical innovations they brought to the sport. The general history slash biography videos are by far the easiest to write and can be done in a day or two. 
It's basically just googling whatever sources I can find that are useful and trying to format the script so that it's roughly chronological. Once the script is written, I record it, add all the pictures and videos in and any music, on-screen text, filters, bada bing bada boom. Since I started making my own videos, I've actually stopped watching a lot of other F1 YouTubers videos because I don't want to get accused of plagiarism. In terms of ideas for topics, things like Andrea Moda and Mastercard Lola have been done to death, but otherwise a lot of it is stuff I think of myself, and I try to go for things that haven't really been touched on much. I've taken inspiration from other F1 channels in terms of style, editing and presentation, mostly Josh Revel, Aldas, Cranky Yankee and F1 livery histories, but otherwise, oddly enough, it's mostly non-F1 channels that have informed my current style. So things like Biographics, Bedtime Stories, Rory McVie, Mentor Pilot, things like that. Fergus Butler asks, can we get a collab with Aidan Millward? I mean, I've never contacted him and I'm guessing he doesn't know who I am, but if he's DTC, so to speak, then I am. Mikos Army asks, who is your favourite F1 team and driver? So, my favourite team, which is a bit of a curveball but probably won't surprise any of you, is Hispania Racing Team, one of the best worst teams in Formula 1 history. As for my favourite driver, he may not necessarily be my favourite driver at the moment, but for most of the time I've been watching Formula 1 it's been Sebastian Vettel. Dorky Nerd asks, what do you think about there being three races in America? Um, I'm not a fan. Considering how packed the calendar is, mostly with races people don't want at the behest of ones they do, I don't think any one country should host more than one race a year. Kota is great, Miami is done and was meh and we don't need to go there again, and I imagine the same thing will happen in Vegas. It looks to be once again another race that prioritises image over entertainment, which leads me to the next question. Ham asks, what's your opinion of this new media-oriented way of F1 weekends? It's almost like the racing is secondary to all the music and off-track events. Uh, I hate it. No one gives a rat's ass about whatever random celebrity who themselves does not give a rat's ass about Formula 1 has been given the kind of paddock access that any true F1 fan would dream of. I also detest the way the sport is constantly sucking up to athletes from other sports in a way that is never reciprocated. When was the last time you saw an F1 driver being interviewed at the FA Cup final or the Super Bowl? Miami demonstrated all of this perfectly. The entire thing was just a completely unnecessary attempt to Americanise the sport, and we had all that needless build-up to what inevitably ends up being a mediocre race. Places like Silverstone, Monza and Spa do not need to ham everything up and get the opinions of influencers no one's heard of, because the races always deliver. Slick Shifter asks, Who, in your opinion, is the most underrated driver in F1 history? Not in terms of success on track, but in terms of overall ability. That is a really difficult question. My perspective is a little limited, as I've only been watching F1 for the past 15 years or so, but I guess I'd go with Heike Kovalainen. He drove extremely well in his debut season, eventually beating Giancarlo Fisichella, getting Renault's only podium that year and almost finishing every race. He didn't do much against Hamilton, though you can't really blame him, but in his three years at Lotus and Caterham his driving was supreme, and I've only come to appreciate it since doing the videos about them. He had little to no competition from the other five drivers, and almost always outqualified the qualifying master Jano Trulli. Because he was running around alone near the back of the grid, he naturally didn't get much attention for this, which also wasn't helped by never scoring any points. That duck kinda guy asks, what's your favourite era of F1? Purely for nostalgia purposes, it's the diffuser era as I like to call it from 2009 to 2013. I miss screeching V8, 24 car grids, Yogam and Bud, cars that broke down from time to time, and drivers that made errors from time to time, and I went to two races during this time. Ivan Tukrai asks, If you were to make your dream F1 lineup, who would be the drivers and the team principal? Right, so for team principal, I would pick Colin Chapman. He's one of the old school team principals who was a skilled mechanic and engineer, and he was a true visionary. No one team has brought more innovations to Formula 1 than Lotus. For drivers, first I would pick Alain Prost, such a well-rounded driver that often gets shafted in place of Ayrton Senna, and a perfect team leader. For second driver, I'd go for Rubens Barrichello. You need someone who's going to crack on, get the job done, and not conflict with the first driver. And for test driver, I'll take Nicholas Latifi. He can bring lots of money while getting minimal opportunities to f*** things up. Switz F1 asks, what is the worst livery of all time in your opinion? I thought the first Honda Earth Dreams livery was superb, but the second one didn't really make any sense and it just looked cheap and unfinished. 
Blobfish King 941 asks, what car looked best in your opinion? I mean the styling, not the livery. This is tricky because it's difficult to disassociate the livery from how a car looks. I don't think many of the cars from 2009 onwards have been particularly good in the styling department. There were some real stinkers in the pre-ground effect 1970s, but I think I'd have to go for the Ferrari F2004. You can see immediately how polished the aerodynamics are, which are sophisticated without being excessively elaborate as they started getting in the following years. Kieran R asks, which off-track innovation contributed the most to Formula 1 in the last 50 years, e.g. in-race refuelling at Brabham, burst telemetry at McLaren, refuelling strategy at Benetton, computer model pit strategy, trackside weather forecasting, digital car to pit radios at McLaren? Gosh, uh, this is something I've never really given a huge amount of consideration to. I don't think you can look past car to pit radios. That has had such a transformative effect on the way races are run. Before radios, the drivers were basically on their own, with the only team communication coming at pit stops, back when they were long enough for you to have a conversation. Now, strategies can be decided on the fly, drivers can be told what their competitors are doing, they can be alerted to weather forecasts, any mechanical problems can be addressed and potentially fixed, and perhaps most crucially, they can be informed directly of any incidents or obstructions on track or any problems that may require them to stop the car. So yeah, thank you all for submitting your questions. I'll probably do another Q&A when slash if I reach 5 or even 10,000 subscribers. In terms of channel plans, I'm going to keep plodding along with the ranking and history videos, uh, but I'm also planning to redo some of the older ones. The first few videos covering Lotus version and HRT are quite rough around the edges in pretty much all areas, so I'm going to do those again, but split the teams into separate videos so it's a bit easier to listen to, and we'll be starting with HRT. That's all for this video, thanks for watching, don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at brook underscore F1, and I'll see you all next time.